Um, ABA is ABA. It's, it's an understanding of these basic principles. It's an understanding of the antecedents and the consequences and what those things do to our behavior choices and knowing how to, to interact and, and apply those. Um, but how we go about in understanding these things and, and interacting and choosing them could be different based upon what kind of a program you're, you, where you learned your ABA from. Some people who have a very low loss based ABA. Then you've got um, a pivotal response training, which is another form of ABA that's being used by Kegels. Um, in, uh, they're in, I think, Northern California. Um, that's, it's still ABA, they're still using ABA principles, but they're, they're, they're prioritizing things in a way that they feel best. I personally have, have learned, uh, and my personal belief is that verbal behavior is the best approach to ABA um, because it adds a few things to the basics of baby behavior that um, I think are extremely important for children who are not verbal and for children to learn how to interact in their everyday environment, not just learn how to how to learn at a table, which you kind of get in a lot of low bus programs, but really how to learn throughout their entire day, which is what we really focus on in verbal behavior. Anyway, there's three contingencies. Behavior, that center thing, that's what we're working on. How do we get a child to say mom when they want mom's attention instead of throwing something at mom? Or how do we get the child to um, raise their hand in a classroom instead of speaking up? Whatever the behavior may be, how do we get a child to use a seven word sentence with the word please in it rather than a four word sentence without please, depending upon what the child's needs might be? Those behaviors are the things we're going to be focused on. Before any behavior, there's going to be three possible things that we have to be aware of. Only three. And that's what's so great about uh, the science of behaviorism. Uh, yes, the concepts, to be able to be really good at this, you need to study it. But the concepts are pretty basic and pretty simple. Um, there's something called uh, a stimuli, a discriminated stimuli. And this is, um, we call it an SD for short. But the idea of an SD is basically saying, Something in the environment makes reinforcement available to the child. What is it? Well, in the case of you guys walking into this room, there was instantly a bunch of stuff in the environment. Well, there were some of those things were SDs. They were things that are discriminated in your mind that when you see them, you say, aha, I know what that gives to me. Those chairs, I know that if I sit in one of these chairs, I won't have to stand and have back problems for two hours. I'm coming here for two hours to listen to this guy speak, I better get myself into one of those chairs while I can. And some of you said, oh, there's a screen on the board. Well, I have bad vision problems, and I need to be able to see what's on that screen because I'm motivated for that. I'm going to sit towards the front. And some of you say, oh, I kind of want to be able to fall asleep. So if I know, or I want to be able to hang out with my friends, and they're sitting in the back. I'm going to go sit in the back. That way he probably won't see me, and I'll be able to put my head back, and he'll, or he'll think that I'm you know, paying attention. So the bottom line is, as you walked in here, you saw all of these different things and you started to make decisions about how you wanted to behave. Based on the fact that in your past, you've learned that certain things give you certain things. Seats give you um, a break from fatigue. Sitting up front gives you an opportunity to see the screen closer or to listen to the speaker closer. Sitting up straight in your seat um, is something that you've learned either through, through um, the way it makes your body feel or through the way your, your parents pounded it into you and made you believe that this is important for you and it became important for you. Um, all of these things have had effects on your behavior. Those things are called SDs. They're things that we've discriminated. Now let's say you would have all walked in here and I had this big silver ball just sitting here in the room and you've never seen anything like it before. And I said, okay you guys, go ahead, you can use the silver ball, I'll be back in an hour. <laughs> Well, how would you behave? How would you react? What would you do? It's too big to move. You might try to push it. You might, you know, feel it to see what it feels like. You might bang on it. You might try all the different things you've tried in your life when you didn't know what something was. These are things that in your past have shown you. Like when you got a present as a kid at Christmas time. I don't know. Yeah. Isn't Santa Claus from Or I don't know. Depends. Um, uh, so you get, you get a present, right? And you've got this thing in your in front of you and it's wrapped. And you say to yourself, okay, uh, how do I figure out what's in there? I want to know. Well, some of us rip it open and peek and then try to take it back up. Others might shake it and listen to it to kind of get a feel for what it is. Um, you might feel how heavy it is. There's all kinds of things that you've done in your past to figure out what things were. 
And whatever behaviors gave you the most information that you wanted, those are the behaviors you continue to use. Well, you're going to try those same behaviors on this new big silver ball here. But still, this ball is, it hasn't given you any reinforcement yet. Unless when you touched it, it felt really good, or when you banged on it, it made a fun sound that you liked. Um, a child with autism, they might see the silver ball, and they may go bang on it and go, ooh, I like that. Bang, 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 bang. Oh, I really like that. Well, now the child says, aha, silver balls are for banging on. That's what they're for. Okay? Bang, bang, bang. And every time they see a silver ball, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to run over and bang on it and see if that holds true. Because they are getting a reinforcement from that. Now, you and I walking into the room banging on it may not find that reinforcing. That may not cause us to want to bang on it again, because we don't really care about that sound. It's not a big deal to us. So now we look at that, we bang, we go, oh, that wasn't successful. Banging didn't work. No point in banging anymore. What else can I do? Well, now let's say I come back from my hour, and you guys are all bored. You're sitting around here, and I go, what? You guys didn't want to use the silver ball? And you're looking at me like, what are you talking about? So you did, how come you didn't use it? And you're like, well, we did use it. We touched it, we banged on it, nothing happened. They go, yeah, but didn't you see this, this thing up here? And then I get up on the top and I push a button, and all of a sudden, it opens up, and there's like a, a portable bar. <laughs> oh, yeah, portable bar. Like, you, know, you know, this all kinds of fair alcohol, disco ball falls down, stress like the whole place is going, you know. And all of a sudden, you go, wow! There's all kinds of reinforcement available to me, and I didn't know it. Well, why didn't you know it? Because you hadn't experienced it. And if you hadn't experienced it, it's not a discriminated stimulus. So what happens in our lives, what learning is, is learning is the process of turning all of these unknown antecedents into discriminated stimuli that we can now use to get to a reinforcement. So the next time somebody, you know, the next time you're walking down the street, you see a big silver ball, I promise you, you'll look on top of it. <laughs> and if there is, I promise you, you'll put it. Because that's what we do. That's what humans do. Kids with autism are no different. They do the things that are most successful to them. And if you think about this, all the inappropriate behaviors that a child with autism is using in his home or in his school environment, he's using those behaviors because those are the behaviors that have been most successful to him in getting the things he wants and needs. And it, doesn't be, and it becomes our responsibility as his teachers to, sh to stop the reinforcement from coming from those behaviors. Hitting your sister does not get your sister to go away and get you to play with the toy she had in her hand. Although in the past it has, and that's why she's constantly hitting her sister, because her sister cries, goes away, mom then goes away with the child and, starts, and the child gets what they wanted. Or maybe they didn't want to brush their teeth. So instead of brushing their teeth, they hit underneath the table. And because mom couldn't get under the table, she said, fine, we'll do it later. <laughs> And the child says, good, well, see, now I know. Every time I don't want to do something, I hide under the table, and I don't have to do it. And those things have been successful for the child getting what they want in the moment. So part of learning is about creating these SDs. What does it mean when I say to you, what do you want? What does that mean? Or if I say to you, what is this? Well, I just gave you an SD, because in your life, those of you who've learned enough English, and most of you seem to have, um, when you hear the words, what is this? and you look at the item that the person is holding, you know that if you respond with the correct response, something positive will happen. Usually, not always. You may, like in this, in this crowded environment, if I walked up to you and I said, what is this? Now, she suddenly, her, her environment just changed very dramatically. Did you see her reaction? She's like, okay, what? Uh, <laughs> sorry, did you see? No. But that's, but that's the case. So right now, you guys are in a nice, comfortable situation. You're one of many. There's lots of people here, and little things that you might do, nobody would notice. But when I'm standing here like this, suddenly you're in the thick of it. You're now part of the process. And now suddenly your behaviors are being watched. So suddenly you have to start thinking more clearly about what is it you're going to do. Well, in that situation, if I say, what is this? For her to say marker or pen or something that would be appropriate, and for me to walk away and her to go, that's over, that's reinforcement. By being able to answer this and just getting me to walk away, that's a form of reinforcement that would cause her to say marker the next time somebody walks up to her with one of these. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So it's really, it's, if we're going to teach children with autism, we have to understand these basic principles and how they apply to our everyday lives and how they apply to our children's lives.